the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Dan Novak, and Gregory Stockel. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, last year, the coronavirus pandemic put a stop to Senegal's yearly jazz music festival for the first time in its 29-year history. This year, the festival returned, bringing much-needed life to the island of San Luis. The island was chosen by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization as a World Heritage Site. UNESCO chooses World Heritage Sites for having cultural, historical, scientific, or other forms of importance. San Luis is famous for its building styles from the 1800s and light-colored houses. Hundreds of jazz fans listened to French Senegalese singer Awali sing blues music on the island recently. Lai said she felt a sense of relief, or ease, with the festival's return. I was relieved, and everybody was relieved too. And it was a beautiful energy, a beautiful vibration, a, a beautiful link also between, between the stage and, and the audience. African rhythms, funk, gospel, and blues music could be heard along the small streets of San Luis. Music played from restaurants, drinking places, and hotels into the early morning. San Luis escaped the deadliest effects of the COVID-19 disease. But a sharp drop in tourism and a weakened economy have left its citizens ready for an emotional lift that only its largest yearly event could provide. The festival in Senegal is known as Africa's biggest jazz festival. But it has struggled with decreasing crowds since having performers like American pianist Herbie Hancock. He last performed there in 1996. Still, the festival gets music fans from across West Africa and Europe and the city's street performers are happy to have them. One of those street performers is 25-year-old Ottoman Daw. He told Reuters, Jazz attracted a lot of tourists, so we could play in the streets, so we managed to collect a little money. Nothing was there last year, but today it is good. Members of Jam Jazz a band from the capital, Dakar, were happy as they performed. The audience danced or sat closely together around crowded tables. The festival not taking place last year was an economic disaster for San Luis, said band leader Mustafa Diop. This year, despite the crisis, the festival was held because if it wasn't, it would be a big blow for the city to come. Australia has criticized a United Nations plan to declare the country's Great Barrier Reef in danger from climate change. The UN's Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization proposed this week 
that the Great Barrier Reef be added to its list of world heritage in danger. A UNESCO committee report said this week it had found that there is no possible doubt that the reef's collection of colorful corals was facing ascertained danger. The Great Barrier Reef covers about 344,000 square kilometers of area on Australia's northeast coast. It contains about 3,000 reefs, natural structures made by very small animals called corals. The reef also includes more than 900 islands. The reef has been listed as a World Heritage Site since 1981. A report by the committee said it found the Great Barrier Reef had suffered major coral bleaching events in 2016, 2017, and 2020. It blamed the events on unusually warm ocean temperatures. UNESCO said the in danger listing was needed to make sure action is taken to protect the reef from the effects of climate change. Such corrective measures would likely include stronger rules to reduce pollution linked to greenhouse gases. Adding the reef to UNESCO's in danger list could also reduce the number of international visitors coming to the area to see the huge collection of colorful corals. Australian officials said they were surprised and saddened at the proposal. This decision was flawed. Clearly there were politics behind it, Environment Minister Susan Lee told reporters. China chairs the UNESCO committee. But when asked about the issue in Parliament, Lee would not say whether she thought China was to blame for the decision. Another Australian government official, however, told Reuters that China was responsible for the committee's position. We will appeal, but China is in control, said the official, who did not want to be named. In Beijing, a foreign ministry spokesman denied the Chinese government was behind the decision. Li said that she and Foreign Minister Maurice Payne had called UNESCO Director General Audre Uzale to officially protest the proposed listing. Some environmental groups praised the UN proposal. Imogen Zetoven is an environmental advisor for the Australian Marine Conservation Society. She told the Associated Press she welcomed the committee's recognition that Australia hasn't done enough on climate change to protect the future of the reef. The reef would become the first site to be added to the list of world heritage in danger because of climate change concerns, Zethoven added. Richard Leck, a spokesman for the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Australia, said the listing would come as a real shock to many Australians. In 2014, Australia was warned that an in danger listing was being considered. The country had time to react by developing a long-term plan called the Reef 2050 Plan to improve the reef's health. But the committee said this week that that plan requires stronger and clearer steps toward fighting the effects of climate change. I'm Brian Lynn. Hey, 
top North Korean official Tuesday signaled that future talks with the United States were unlikely. The comments came days after North Korean leader Kim Jong Un talked about the possibility of opening talks with the U.S. Kim Yo Jong is the powerful sister of the North Korean leader. She said in a statement that the U.S. has the wrong expectation about her brother's recent comments. The U.S. is looking at the situation in a way to seek comfort for itself, she told the state-run Korean Central News Agency. She added that the expectation for talks with North Korea will lead the U.S. into greater disappointment. Last week, Kim Jong Un said at a ruling party meeting. That his country must be ready for both dialogue and confrontation. President Joe Biden's administration said last month that it was open to talks with North Korea, but the administration added that North Korea must give up its nuclear weapons. Jake Sullivan is the White House National Security Advisor. He told ABC News that Kim's comments were an interesting signal, but that he wants a clearer message from North Korea. He also said the U.S. wanted to restart negotiations with North Korea about its nuclear program. This week, Sung Kim, the U.S. diplomat for North Korea, met with South Korean and Japanese officials on the North Korean issue. He said he hopes North Korea will agree to meet any time, anywhere, without preconditions. Jenny Town is a Korean expert at the Stimson Center in Washington D.C. She said Kim Yo Jong's statement does not fully eliminate the idea that diplomacy can restart. She noted that the statement appears to suggest it's not likely for now. North Korea has boycotted talks with the United States since 2019. Kim Jong Un and former U.S. President Donald Trump met in February of that year in Vietnam. North Korea offered to close a nuclear center in exchange for a lifting of sanctions, but Trump rejected the offer. Since then, the coronavirus pandemic has made talks all but impossible. North Korea closed its border in January 2020, and it limited contact with the outside world, including its main trading partner, China. Leif Eric Easley is a professor at Iwa University in Seoul. He said the border closings have caused much economic hardship in the country. At a meeting with senior officials last week, Kim Jong Un admitted that his country is facing a tense food situation. Easley said these meetings are largely political theater. To cover up failures of economic planning and oppressive social control, I'm Dan Novak. U.S. lawmakers, educators, and students. Are among those pushing for all school-age children to be taught more Asian American history. The Asian American Student Union at Farmington High School in the state of Connecticut is part of this effort. It organized a meeting after the killing of six Asian women in Atlanta, Georgia, in March. Lily Fang is co-president of the group. She thought maybe ten or fifteen students would attend, 
By the end of the meeting, however, nearly 100 people had joined. When she saw the reaction of other students, she said she knew how much they wanted to learn about Asian American issues. Fang said, Our Asian American and Pacific Islander community members, they want their voices to be heard. The study group has brought in speakers, had discussions, and created lessons about Asian American history. Illinois could become the first state to require public schools to teach events of Asian American history if the governor signs a bill that passed the state legislature in May. Lawmakers have proposed similar requirements this year in Connecticut, New York, and Wisconsin. Jennifer Gong Gershowitz is an Illinois state representative. She said she supported the bill because of increasing anti Asian violence and language. Gong Gershowitz said she knew little of the discrimination her family had faced in earlier generations. She said she knew so little because it was not taught in school and her family did not speak openly about it. She did not learn about the Chinese Exclusion Act until she studied at law school. The act was an 1882 law that placed restrictions on immigration from China. The law was withdrawn. In 1943, Gong Gershowitz learned about the threat of removal from the country that the law represented for her grandparents. She said she understands that history is central to dealing with violence today. She said empathy comes from understanding, and we cannot do better unless we know better. United States Representative Grace Meng is a member of the Democratic Party from New York. She has reintroduced legislation meant to increase the teaching of Asian American history. The bill would require the presidential and congressional academies to include Asian American history in their acceptance process. The academies offer history and civilian government responsibility programs for teachers. The bill would also support including Asian American history on state and national tests. Nicholas Hartlepp is a professor at Berea College in Kentucky. He wrote a book about the way Asian Americans are shown in learning materials. He said Asian Americans are mostly not included in school books. He also said it is good to see legislation aimed at teaching history, but funding to support the requirements is necessary for them to make a difference. I'm Gregory Stockel. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Rutherford B. Hayes. He took office in 1877 and was president during the end of what Americans call Reconstruction, the period following the Civil War. Hayes had a public image as an honest, dignified man. And even though he had ideas that were radical at the time, he supported moderate policies and measured change. One exception was alcoholic drinks. Hayes banned wine and liquor from the White House. Before Rutherford Hayes was born, his father died. Not too long after that, his older brother died too. As a result, 
Hayes grew up mostly with just his mother and his older sister. Later, an uncle helped raise him as well. As a boy, Rutherford Hayes was called Rudd. He grew up on a farm in Ohio and spent his early years playing with his sister, who taught him to love books. Hayes was an excellent student, and in time he attended Kenyon College and Harvard Law School. Hayes started his career as a lawyer in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio. He did not go into a field that made much money. Instead, he defended people who were poor or in difficult situations. He also courted the woman he would marry. Lucy Webb, like Hayes' mother and sister, strongly influenced the way Hayes thought. Hayes' own views at the time were moderate. He drank alcohol, but not much. He opposed slavery, but he was not an anti-slavery activist. His new wife, however, was strongly against alcohol and slavery. She was part of social movements at the time to ban alcoholic drinks entirely in the United States. And she encouraged Hayes to defend not only the poor in his law business, but also runaway slaves. Together, Rutherford and Lucy Hayes formed an equal marriage committed to helping others. They were known for being friendly, informal, and welcoming. They also went on to have eight children, five of whom survived to adulthood. Lucy Webb Hayes said, Her husband was always calm as a father and took time, even when he was president, to care for his children. Because Hayes had such a positive public image, it is ironic that the contest that elected him president was one of the most hostile in U.S. history. The full story is complex, but the general story is that Hayes was the Republican candidate and Samuel Tilden was the Democratic candidate. Tilden won more popular votes across the country, but in the U.S. system, the majority of voters do not choose the president. Instead, a few electors in each state cast votes. In a way, then, the states choose the president. And in the election of 1876, three southern states gave conflicting reports. It was not clear whether Tilden or Hayes had won South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Even though the election was held in November, the debate over the winner lasted until the following March, days before the new president was to be sworn in. One of the most serious accusations was that Democrats in the South had prevented many black men from voting. If those men had been able to vote, they almost certainly would have voted for Hayes. In the end, a special commission in Congress gave the votes in all three disputed states to Rutherford Hayes. His opponents pointed out that the majority of people on the commission were Republicans. As a result, they said, the new president had earned his position only because of party politics. They called him Rutherford and his fraudulency. But in the end... Hayes was widely considered an independent president who operated outside of party loyalties. One of Hayes' first acts as president was probably his most important. He withdrew federal troops from southern states. 
the troops had been trying to protect the civil and political rights of African Americans. But white Democrats disliked the federal government's involvement in their affairs. Also, the troops were not very effective. So, Hayes said, if Southern officials promised to obey the country's laws, protecting all people equally, he would end the federal government's occupation of their states. The officials agreed, and the period known as Reconstruction officially ended. But as the years went on, the rights of black Americans were increasingly violated. As a result, part of Hayes' legacy is one of betrayal. His policy permitted systemic violence and racism to continue for decades. Another of his important acts was to reform the country's civil service. For the most part, members of Congress offered their political allies government jobs with good pay. But Hayes sought to change the rules. He wanted to give government jobs to the most able workers. While his goal was a good one, his action shocked and angered many members of Congress. The Democrats especially sought to weaken Hayes' position by removing the president's ability to veto their bills. Hayes fought back and won. By the second half of his term, Hayes had restored some of Americans' trust in government that had been lost under the two presidents before him, Andrew Johnson and Ulysses S. Grant. He had helped ease the tensions between the North and South. He had stabilized the economy. He had increased the power of the presidency in a mostly positive way, and he had prepared the way for major civil service reform. But Hayes is not remembered as an especially great president. He is often placed toward the middle, not one of the best and not one of the worst. Some historians suggest that Hayes would be better remembered if he had stayed a second term and supervised some of the gains begun in his first years. But Hayes had promised that he would serve only one term as president. So, true to his word, Hayes did not seek re-election. Hayes had always believed that the best way to solve the country's problems was to improve the education system. So, in his retirement, Hayes became president of two social welfare organizations. One aimed to provide a Christian education to blacks in the South. One of the people helped by that organization was the well-known writer and activist W.E.B. Du Bois. Hayes also led a group aimed at reforming the country's prison system. When he was 70 years old, Hayes fell ill. Although he had a big heart for children and for helping people, he died of heart failure. Afterwards, one of his sons began a new tradition in honor of his father. He established the first presidential library. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.